welcome. Hello. Okay. So thank you, Nuno, for saving some time to make your presentation on Earth observation to, to our students at Nova School of Business and Economics. Uh, you already attended Ana Paula presentation, so feel free also to make the bridge with the Ana Paula presentation. So the idea is to make a presentation of about 20 minutes, 25, like Ana Paula, and then we open for questions, okay? Okay. No Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, open and share my screen. Share screen. Okay, I have a few slides on, uh, on, um, uh, on Earth observation for fisheries and microculture. Uh, so my name is Jun Katrina, I'm Head of Data Systems for uh, Deimos. Um, so I, I will go through the background of uh, how we got here, uh, the present activities and, and, and future, what, uh, what we have in mind for the near and far future. So Deimos is an um, Earth Observation Systems company, so it's a basically a space company, a space uh, engineers company. And we work from uh, system platforms to sensors to data access data systems, and more recently in earth observation applications. And this is the focus of, uh, of what I'm going to talk about here. So basically, this is um, the, the earth observation applications are uh, systems or services that get um, remote sensing and the satellite and drone and eventually even in situ uh, images for uh, creating value-added services for a number of uh, different uh, uh, economic areas. So uh, fisheries and agriculture being uh, one or two of them. Um, so we have, in the data systems division, we have now 40, well, we have 47 people now uh, with about half in Portugal. Um, we, we have our, our traditional area is mission data systems. So for this, we have a suite of products called Round segment for EO, so GS for EO. And we're now creating an ecosystem. I don't like to call it a platform because uh, it, it's open and it's, uh, uh, it, it's a collaborative um, uh, approach. But the, the goal is to have this ecosystem where non-Earth observation expert user can create their own applications and can, can uh, provide value added. Uh, services uh, um, very quickly. So we're using all the, the legacy from uh, GS for EO, uh, but the, there are some parallels between both systems, but there are uh, also uh, a major number of, of differences. So Earth observation is basically uh, the, so, uh, a system that brings you data in support of decisions. Okay, so basically you have a whole pipeline where you collect the data, you develop methods for uh, processing that, that data, you get results and organize the results in terms of a service, and then you support the decision taking processes, like uh, if you're going to, to extend the fishing period or if you, you allow an aquaculture industry to, to set up in a given place. Uh, the, the colors here basically mean my, my uh, view of what what are the, the advancement levels of each of the step of the process. So for the data, I put it in yellow because I think there is a lot of data already. Um, there may be some uh, particular needs uh, in some particular cases. The data is there. The access to the data sometimes fails, but uh, you typically can do that. Methods, there are a lot of, uh, of algorithms already done by universities, by research centers and by industry. Uh, in all sorts of areas of application of Earth observation. Results, um, so results, the difference between from methods and results is, methods is the development of the algorithm, results is application to a given uh, uh, case of interest. So not an academic case, but a, a real case of, with, with uh, value added. So this is um, less uh, advanced. There are some results, some really interesting results um, that have been uh, appearing, but uh, it's there's still so, uh, some uh, some things to do, and the the big problem is the connection with the decision making process. So the the connection between the what are the abstract or technology development uh, 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 the, the development systems to the actual application in a real uh, commercial cases or uh, uh, or for uh, monitoring for taking decisions real time decisions and. and uh, in, in, uh, in the, the, the organizations. 
So for, to give you just some examples outside of this area, so hurricane detection and forecast, uh, weather forecast. So this, this, are, uh, this is an area where Earth observation developed much sooner than, than in any other areas. It's an area where it's dominated by um, the, the World Meteorological Organization and uh, uh, in Europe by the ECMWF. So this is quite an organized and institutional area. And this is was one of the first of the, the first in parallel to telecommunications. So the first area where satellites uh, had, had a big impact and in particular Earth observation. The other one is uh, more recent. So this is actually using um, color images to detect uh, what are oil spills and also uh, radar images from satellite. So you can detect uh, uh, oil spills from, from ships. This is not only from accidents in ships, but because of, um, of uh, the big ships, big tankers, washing their containers in, uh, in the high ocean, which is forbidden, but they, they still do it. So basically you get the data, optical and SAR, you do the detection of oil spills, you identify what was the, the, the responsible ship, and you act and go, go there and get uh, either the marine police or, or um, get them to court. Um, so what we've been doing in, in, in the whole area of Earth observation, but more specifically in, in fisheries. So our biggest project uh, by now has been next year's. This has been working on the, the, the data pipeline, the data section of the pipeline. This is a, a large catalog of Earth observation data. Uh, which catalogs all the data. The data is not there. The data is, is linked in, uh, from the catalog, but we have uh, currently about uh, more than 10 million data sets there. I believe it's one of the biggest uh, Earth observation catalogs uh, in Europe and eventually uh, even in the world. Um, so this is a typical catalog. You look for the data. And by the way, it's open. You can go there. It's catalog.nextyears.eu and you can search for the data um, and you can download it then. So you get uh, such results, you search for an area of interest for a given date, and you get all sorts of results there uh, uh, that you can then download and use in real time. Then another thing that we've done um, that we've been acting on is monitoring of fishing activity. Uh, this is to um, support the, the monitoring of, human, of, uh, of fishing activities and to quantify or try to characterize the fishing pressure and related with um, with uh, for the Portuguese uh, EEZ for now, uh, and to basically raise awareness of the human foot footprint uh, regarding fisheries. Um, so one of the activities we've done here was sea motion. This is uh, an activity that we did with the Hydrographical Institute and DIPMA, uh, which are typically very difficult institutions to get together. Uh, but we managed and the project went quite well. So basically, the Radiographical Institute um, contributed with bathymetry. So this is depth of the of the of the sea floor, and uh, uh, surface dynamics and surface currents from their HF radar network. Uh, the CMAMS, which is the Copernicus European um, Maritime Service, uh, gave us chlorophyll and sea surface temperature, and we have from the, the GRM the vessel monitoring system. And also not here, but from uh, from uh, IPMA, also the models for ocean currents. And here, for example, we have an estimate of the uh, potential fishing areas and the uh, correlation with, for example, chlorophyll concentration. Or you can click and see the the the, the dependence on the deep on the, the depth below surface. And you can see where fish tend to concentrate and typically the correlation is much bigger with, with bathymetry, which was expected. Um, but there's also some correlation with the other areas. So you have a, an approximate estimate of where the fish would be at a given time. So the way we did this was a um, sort of a small neural network algorithm trained by these three, uh, uh, by chlorophyll, by uh, sea surface temperature and, and uh, surface depth. Uh, and then we train this with the data from fish catches, which was provided by the GRM. We do a correlation of what what these areas can be. Uh, there is a paper also from NOAA where they do this even with the additional species like turtles and and even dolphins, so that they can, for example, assess how to minimize the bycatch, which is the catch of the fish that you don't want, or fish or species that you don't want, like uh, uh, fishes, uh, turtles, and and dolphins that sometimes come up in the, in the net. Um, 
then we are we are doing with uh, with the Azores region a project on um, uh, swordfish and uh, and two types of tuna, which are the big fisheries uh, there. The pelagic species are, are, are uh, uh, let's call it the deeper ocean species, so not coastal. Um, and here we're following a similar approach, but uh, with the use of the fishing effort, which is slightly different. It's different than the fish catches, but it, it should be highly correlated. So we're doing this study of the footprint of uh, the pelagic species of these two species, of swordfish and uh, of uh, tunas. Um, and we only also analyze the, the, the paths that the fish fishing uh, boats uh, follow uh, in uh, while they're, they're they're fishing to understand if they're uh, fishing in legal areas and if they're going to marine protected areas and so on. So we have a lot of information. We can understand, for example, from their uh, uh, fishing uh, paths. Well, I cannot, but experts can understand from their fishing paths what kind of fishery are they doing, and and with that they can understand if 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 they are fishing. Uh, the, the right fish that they have uh, permission to do or, or, or wrong types of fish. Um, so these are examples uh, of, uh, of different uh, fishing techniques that can be, for example, you can see that this pattern is completely different than uh, another one. This is a uh, trolling method, I, I believe. Uh, and you can also do a vessel detection with uh, radar data. So um, um, with, with satellite data. So the, the, the ship tracking here is done with a signal that is emitted by the boats, which is the called AIS, automatic, automatic identification system. But they can, if they're fishing illegally, they can turn it off or they can just put a, a, a zinc bucket on top of the antenna and uh, no one sees where they are from this signal. So you can also detect it uh, from radar. This is, of course, when the radar is, is available on, on, that, on that zone, so it's not as reliable, but at least uh, covers these um, inconsistencies. Uh, so, for example, here you have a lot of detected, uh, detected chips and some that were reported, but most of them were not. They may be uh, recreational vessels as well. Uh, here's another example. You have uh, detected and, um, and uh, reported fish, uh, fishing uh, uh, um, boats. One of the things that we plan to use, this is not, we're using in another area, it's uh, machine learning for uh, imagery class classification. So we're using this in, um, for, for example, for detecting trees and for understanding uh, courses of um, um, paths of uh, roads and, uh, and uh, rivers. And we intend to, uh, to do that also for, for uh, identifying uh, ships automatically and to have this feed our, our, our systems. Uh, we have other, other systems for coasts, uh, mod modeling the sediment disturbance, uh, sewage plumes, litter accumulation. This is all information that um, is useful for assessing, for example, impacts, uh, in some cases, uh, impacts of uh, algae mats, for example, that can, uh, um, can have impacts on aquaculture or uh, even aquaculture can, can have an impact on, on coastal pollution. Um, and, uh, we, we are getting all this together in what we call uh, service services for EO. So we have uh, several parts of the system that are, are being deployed. So it makes this all automatic. And in particular, we have NextOcean. So NextOcean is the project where you're going to, you, you're going to work in. Um, so this project is basically, the, the goal is to build specific services for aquaculture and fisheries with potential users of these systems. So we have to work with, uh, with, uh, with, with the users on understanding what, what are the needs and what uh, they should um, uh, have a lot of uh, input in, uh, uh, in requesting uh, what, what kind of information they need. Uh, we have this process of service adaptation uh, and then of uh, growing to, to a larger service to, to larger areas of, of market. And then communication capacity building is typically part of all these, these projects. So basically getting new users and uh, doing the loop again. We have 12 partners in this, in, in this project. Some of them, uh, a couple of them are more technologically driven. Uh, we have several users uh, and several, a couple of uh, some universities. Um, this is focused, as I said, officially in aquaculture is a three million project for three years um, with H2020 funding. And 
so that you can have a, an overview of what we're doing there from the technical side. Uh, I'll go from top to bottom, which is uh, probably easier. So we have four user scenarios. One is monitoring phishing activities and impact. So this uh, is a scenario where the user wants to understand where the fishermen are, uh, what, what will be the impact of fishing that species in that, in that area and so on. So this is more uh, towards uh, um, uh, national uh, entities such as uh, Pesca, for example. Um, so this relies on fish monitoring and surveilling, uh, surveillance modules and then characterization of fishing areas. And then you understand, you develop the algorithms to understand if they are or the algorithms and sometimes you also do visually. Um, you understand if, if you have a probability of, uh, uh, of um, non, uh, non uh, uh, desired behavior, let's, let's call it like that. Then we have a, a second uh, uh, scenario, which is support to sustainable trade, eco labeling, and minimization of bycatch. There are some institutions who are working on, uh, for example, uh, certification of, uh, of fishing areas that uh, the, the, the and fishing areas and techniques. So, uh, for example, fish provenance is uh, an eco labeling is one of the of the the, the modules that. that will provide inputs for, for this and the characterization of fishing areas as well. And then we have the aquaculture services, which is one is the monitoring of aquacultures, which will monitor the aquaculture site, for example, with the detection of uh, harmful algae blooms, which is a danger for, for the offshore or near shore or offshore uh, ocean-based uh, aquacultures and the fish farm impacts. So basically if a, a fish farm is installed in a given place, what are its expected impacts on the environment in the uh, mid to short term? Uh, for example, on uh, pollution in uh, touristic areas in beaches, for example. Um, and so uh, uh, we have the two services, which are the monitoring of the agriculture structure, and then one to support the installation of new agricultures, both for the companies that want to install a new agriculture um, uh, deployment or for national authorities, we need to do the approval and these processes are not uh, systematically uh, defined yet. So for example, in this case, we do the site risk assessment. So the assessment that the risk, that that area uh, has uh, along, uh, along, uh, along the, the time. So with the, in terms of marine pollution and uh, whether there's weather and ocean parameters that are con consistent with uh, doing operations on the offshore and um, what will be the, the, the impact on the, on the environment. So this is our, let's say, baseline service. On the bottom, we have all the, the sources of data that we, that we are uh, tapping. So this is the baseline of the services that will be further evolved with the, with the users and with, with your help. Um, just to show you a, a, a little bit more data, this is from the site called Marine Traffic. This is the, the, the traffic of ships at any given time. Um, identified in, on their site. This is marinetraffic.com. Um, so there is a lot of this. Is all type of, these are all, all, all types of ships, not only uh, fishing. And this is, for example, what um, uh, the Global Fishing Watch uh, uh, consortium from several entities uh, is, is doing. So they are uh, following also tracks of, of ships. Uh, around the world and uh, correlating with this area. So similar, very similar to what we're doing and we are in touch with them um, to assess if, uh, if we can share information. Sharing information, by the way, is something very difficult in, in these areas. Uh, information is like the new goal. Just a couple of slides more on uh, how we intend to, to ex extend this and to um, then have this available to a wider uh, uh, number of users. So the goal, one of the, the projects we have ongoing uh, sponsored by, by the European Space Agency is a marketplace of uh, Earth observation uh, applications. So the goal is you go online, you select the service and you automatically get an output of that service. But to, for the fisheries, we have several services already uh, being put there, but for a fisheries and agriculture service to, to be at this stage, where it can be automatized, we still have uh, a, a long way to go. Um, so this is the, the looking field of how you select the service. This is not final, by the way. Um, okay, so um, this is 
what we we plan to support in the in the near future. So we are working on the access to data chain methods, chaining, extracting results. But now the mo most of our focus is uh, in get uh, um, in making bridges with users and with understanding uh, how can we help them um, uh, take uh, more informed decisions or uh, use the information available to them for their own um, their own duties. By the way, we have open traineeships in business development for us observation and in project management. So if you know, if you are interested or if you know something, just uh, let me know. Um, and thank you very much. So, sorry. Um, I guess well, you're muted, Luis. Thank you, Nuno, for the nice overview. And uh, let's open for questions. C can you go back to the slide where you have the different user scenarios? Yep. So. This one. OK. So. There was a, a question here. Let me see the, the question, what it says. Um, we'll launch the question. Are site risk assessments not made for user C? User scenario, you mean? Site risk assessment? No. Site risk assessment is for user scenario D. OK. The, 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 that um, the monitoring of culture sites, this is done for scenario C. The site risk assessment uh, is preliminary to the installation of the aquaculture. So yeah. we do an historical assessment of the, of the <coughs> algae blooms, of the marine pollution, and whether in ocean parameters to understand what will be the impact on the productivity, for example, and the impact of the, of the aquaculture. So this is prior to the installation of aquaculture. So this is done with historical data. The monitoring of the site is done in real time. So we also have the, the detection of harmful algae blooms and of marine pollution, but in real time from SAR and optical data. Okay. Here you can use all yep. sorts of historical data. So let's open for questions. Um, yeah, I would have another question. So, um, by using the Earth observation technologies, such as satellites for um, new agriculture, is it also possible to, or do you, with your um, with your project or your company, also use sensor data from um, sort of from the water? So, do you combine this satellite data with data from um, yeah from the maritime areas? Yes, definitely. I mean, we, we use uh, all sorts of data that, that is available. For example, in the two projects I've shown before, um, which are basically the foundations for this one, um, we are using data from uh, the, the ship fisheries. And this comes from, um, um, from the electronic uh, log, log books that the fishermen have to fill whenever they get to the to the docks, to, to the capacity docks, for example. Um, and we're using the fishing efforts uh, data, which is the time that they are out at sea, which they uh, it's also available to, to regional authorities. For example, in the in, uh, in the fish uh, in, in the fishing logs, we have the information of where each uh, fish, uh, which fish or each fish uh, uh, was was caught. So this is very important to assess the, um, the, the the stocks available and the, the impact on the stocks and um, and this is the information for example that is used every year by the GRM through IPMA IPMA does the research part um, and the GRM decides for example when to close the fishing of sardine so we need to use also uh, ground based data typically the way that our observation uh, you, uh, works is you have a global view with our with with satellite systems. Or satellite or drone, and but you need always to use local information to understand what you're seeing. So definitely, you need a lot of uh, ground-based information. There is another question in the chat from Maya. 
She says, in the sector of Earth observation, are there any innovations to be developed in terms of generating more types of data? Um, more types of data? Ryan? Sorry? I lost the I, I was just asking Maya if she has the yes. camera. Uh, wait, yeah, I can turn it on. So, so yeah, I was wondering if there are like any innovations in the process because you told told us that there is like, for example, temperature monitoring that you can track the algae, but maybe if there are like any innovations to be developed to track more different kinds of data or if there is like any space for innovation or in, info that you would need. I'm, um, uh, I'm not supposed to talk uh, bad about innovation, but there has been a lot of innovation. That's why I say that the algorithms part is quite well developed. That doesn't mean that we have everything that we need to make the services, but the innovation has been like the strongest part and Europe is, is, is way ahead of the rest of the world there. Um, what is needed now is the transition to um, value-added services. So it's getting the innovation, uh, the innovative uh, 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 things that are already developed and take the time, let's call it the boring time if you want, to make it a service. So you're not, you're going from uh, research to implementation and the development of a service. And this is like scaling what, uh, what you're doing in a lab to a full factory. So I believe to Zell and Musk that did that this is, is it, it's 1000 times more difficult to scale something that you did in a lab to a factory than to first do it in a, in a lab in the first place. So. I'd say we're very good at uh, the, the lab part. We're not very good at the factory part yet. And this is our biggest effort is there. That doesn't mean that we're stopping innovation. We still have a lot of projects ongoing and this, is, this will be one of them. There will be evolution in the algorithms, but the focus has to be on uh, having the innovation, not per se, but because it's requested by the user. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I, I can put a question uh, while students think about other questions, which is, you were speaking about uh, your uh, Deimos is trying to enter, or Elecnor Deimos is trying to enter into the downstream industry, yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. So basically, um, how do you foresee, or what are the main challenge for you, for a company like Deimos to enter into the downstream industry, into this part of the market, which is much closer to the end user? There are a lot of challenges, not that many risks. Um, so the challenges, uh, the main challenge now, uh, or the main blocking point, is the the bridges that we uh, are making with the users. So this is definitely what what we need to where we need to go uh, to go to go forward. The, I say that there, there are not a lot of risks because there is a lot of investment from Europe in making this, uh, this a success. And um, in, in particular, there's the Copernicus program, uh, which is a big, uh, well, they, they spent more than probably 10 billion uh, uh, euros in the last uh, seven or eight years. They've launched uh, more um, five types of satellites and they are ensuring for the first time that uh, satellite data will be available uh, from now on. Um, so until now, it was until a few years ago, until 2010, uh, it was more um, R&D satellites, uh, which were used for developing applications. Now these satellites are, are there for, uh, for people to build services. Um, and there are also a lot of support services like Copernicus Marine Service. So everything is there to make this a, a success. Now it's just how we understand the user's needs and, uh, and how we can adapt to them. So this is the main, the main uh, generic challenge for the, for the area. For us in particular, I mean, there are big players in the area. We are quite well positioned in Europe. We have a huge uh, network of contacts, a lot of investment already, well, already done. Uh, but you have Google, for example, you have Amazon uh, going there. Um, these are non-standard markets for them because uh, automated systems don't work here. So it's, this is not a software problem. Um, but still they are there. Uh, Amazon has all the, the European data 
uh, there, uh, Google has a uh, Google Earth uh, engine. Um, so there are a lot of things to do. Ah, by the way, going back to the innovation, yes, there is innovation needed. And that is in business development. The models that we have for business development are typically not very much applicable here. And why? Well, in some markets are like, uh, for example, the, the, the defense market. But this is a market which is very much supported by states and, uh, and Europe in particular. Uh, and so with, uh, with, uh, with the money comes, uh, comes, of course, the strings attached, meaning that you have global coverage of images, but having global coverage of services is very difficult for political reasons. So for example, no um, US entity would hire probably an European service unless it's quite advanced. One of the examples of that is if you go to CNN and watch the weather forecast of CNN, it's actually done by the European service. And they mentioned that it's done by Copernicus uh, weather service. Uh, but that is very difficult to, 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 to attain unless you have a, a really big uh, advancement there and Europe does have that case. So thank you, Nuno. Let's see if there is any, uh, any other question. Hello, if I could make a question. Please go uh, ahead. I would, I would be more in, interested to understand how it's possible to do the characterization of the fishing areas, since I think it needs the combination of EO data with ground sources. So if uh, Nun could build up a bit on that, so I get more insights how it works. Um, you mean in the in the case of the pelagic species or the, the coastal species or both? Uh, the coastal species. Okay, so basically, uh, in that case, what we what we did, uh, and there is a lot to expand there. So what we did is you put together in the same system data from um, chlorophyll. So this is basically correlated what what the food the, uh, the food for the fish right so uh, the water temperature and the bathymetry so the, the the bottom so the coastal species they don't go uh, away from the coast because the, they are away from the bottom that's where all the organic matter uh, is so basically we track their their environment which is the temperature and currents and their uh, their feeding uh, sources and you can characterize with all sorts of things, but they are typically uh, um, not as important as this ones, as the bathymetry, the uh, phytoplankton, and, uh, and the water temperature. And then, in parallel, you gather uh, ground-based data, namely where they fished a, a given um, species. Okay. And a long time, you can see that there are trends in where the, the quantities of fish that they fish have, uh, are dependent on these parameters of the water and of, on the bathymetry. And so that means that you can train your network to, uh, to do a forecast of how much they will fish in that area and have a proxy or a, a, an approximation of what the fish stocks are in that given year. There are a lot of risks here. And this is an indirect method, and, but this is, by the way, this is how, how it's done, not with satellite data, but it's done through the, um, the, the stocks estimates. And Eatma, for example, they have ships that go and, and assess fish in, in several areas. Um, but this is how we estimate the fish stocks uh, that exist and how we uh, assess if the, the fish stocks are, are going up or down um, uh, throughout the years. Mm -hmm. The impact of the environment is sometimes uh, uh, higher than the, the impact of the, the, the fishing pressure in the in a given spot for any of the species. So it's um, we can say that with the characterization of fishing areas, we can reduce bycatch, right? So we reduce the risk of capturing species that are not targeted, and also we can say that it minimizes the impact. The like uh, environmental impact of the of the vessels since they don't have to go so they have like 
a more optimized ship um, route since they know where they have to fish? Ideally, yes. I mean, if you think about uh, having in the future, in the I'd say uh, far future, uh, fully autonomous ships without uh, without people, uh, we'll, we'll, so autonomous ships doing the fisheries. Yes, that can be information uh, uh, provided to them. But for now, I think the fishermen fishermen know a lot more than we do. For example, mm -hmm. I know that they use, for example, the moonlight to to as input for for the fishing. So. Uh, we're a long way of, uh, to replace the, the fishermen, and this is not necessarily what, what is uh, the goal. The goal is to understand, for example, you have areas that, that uh, w there is a, a, a big push to have a, a bigger number of marine protected areas, for example. And for that, you have to have information on uh, what will be the impact of that on, on the fishermen and uh, what will be the, the impact of that on the environment for authorities to take that decision. There are also restricted fishing areas where they can fish from uh, time, uh, from time and uh, so, uh, from pe certain periods throughout the year. So, I would say that the, the exact goals um, are, are more to to contribute to sustainable fisheries, both from the fisherman point of view, and so it's more on the education side, and uh, then with the authorities providing them information beforehand so they can can uh, take action when, when, when it's needed. Mm -hmm. For example, so we... uh, uh, one, one example that uh, I've been uh, sort of described is how the fishing quota is defined in Europe. So basically there are two processes in parallel. One is by the, G, uh, the GRM, I believe uh, Doca Pescas should be very heavily involved there. And uh, this is uh, one part. And the other part is a technical assessment that feeds the information uh, uh, for the political uh, uh, side. In parallel, there are discussions in Europe, there are technical discussions, and then there are uh, uh, advices going to the, to the political uh, discussions. And then the, the quota is defined, the quota for each country is defined with this information. The more information you have, the more you can, uh, you have uh, um, basically um, things to negotiate and to be get a better position within these negotiations. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Any final question? Uh, I maybe have one more question, if that's yeah, okay. Ahead, yeah. um, I was wondering how you would estimate like the demand for EO services in the fishing and aquacultural um, sector. So ba basically, would you say um, like NGOs demanded the most, governments maybe also, or would you say that it's mainly the fisheries or the aquacultural companies that uh, demand these services? No one is demanding it. That's the thing. It, this is a heavily <laughs> funded area from the technological point of view. So this is definitely a, a, a um, technology push area, and that's what we're trying to go against and to try now to do the match with the uh, with the uh, needs of the pull from the needs side. Okay. Okay. The, the raw truth. No one is demanding it. <laughs> but it's but very technological, technological innovation. <laughs> If you go, if you go to the given cases, and if you talk to people, for example, we have uh, um, we have a project that uh, that is uh, doing coastal bathymetry assessment from from satellite, and we are going to uh, the city halls in coastal areas, and indeed they do have a lot of need from this information, but they don't know that it can come necessarily from from uh, satellites. So they would ask bathymetry to the Hydrographical Institute, not to uh, not Wells or to any uh, earth observation company. So there is a very low awareness of what are the potentials of earth observation. Okay, thank you. And maybe where would you see the most potential? Do you think that governments would be open for it, or would you like recommend to start with like fisheries and raise awareness there? Without the governments in the fisheries sector, you cannot do anything. Right? It's okay. a very uh, governmental controlled uh, area. Um, but what I see in general in Earth observation is you first need help from the public authorities, okay? Because they have a lot of knowledge and they have a lot of information that, that you can work with and they can work with your information. So this is definitely the first step for adopting Earth observation services. In parallel, there are cases where Earth observation can be profitable, let's say, or sustainable in, in, in the private sector, but those are very, very, very few yet. Um, 
but so I, I need you need the leverage of the public sector, but earth observation will pick up when the private sector starts getting it, and they will only start getting it when the investment is to do it is not is not too big. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you all. Uh, I'm just going to ask you, if possible, to turn on the camera so we take a picture to send to Nuno and Ana Paula to thank them for their presentation. And uh, a great applause to both of you. Thank you, Nuno. Thank you Ana Paula. And uh, okay. I'm sure you raised, a, you solved a lot of questions, but probably raised even more, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Carlos, do you know how to do a print screen? Yeah. Can you please take a print screen? Yes, Luis. It's not. It's not exactly as observation technology. So <laughs> I I'm think using all of us know. So no, all of us know how to do it.